our keynote speaker this afternoon is Rindy DeCruz. Rindy is the Associate Director and Placemaking Co-Director of the nonprofit City Repair Project in Portland, Oregon. Rindy is in her fifth year working with City Repair, the Village Building Convergence, as a social cultural anthropologist and permaculture educator who's been living in Portland since 2010. Rindy facilitates and supports a variety of initiatives, including place making, capacity building, homelessness advocacy, cultural sustainability, diversity, equality and inclusion, and social permaculture. She's also a passionate herbalist, natural building enthusiast, technology advocate, animal lover, and a permaculture urban homesteader. As Rindy gives her remarks, please make sure you take a time or two to write down some questions and hold them up, and one of our volunteers will be happy to answer our questions at the end. Rindy, would you like to join us, please? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope your bellies are full. <clears throat> hmm. Technical question, how do I click? Oh, right here, thanks. Ah. All right, so um, I'm from City Repair, and we are a local nonprofit based in Portland, Oregon. And it is my great pleasure and honor to be here with you today, see a room full of smiling faces and um, people ready to do good things in the world and who have been doing good things in the world. And I call this presentation Self-Repair to, to Culture Repair because I believe um, that it is really important that while we are trying to do things out there, whether it's sustainable energy or food systems or um, taking care of wildlife and things like that, or equity, <clears throat> it is also simultaneously very important to be um, challenging ourselves, taking care of ourselves, taking care of our families um, and loved ones. And so through my journey, it has been very personal that I've chosen to do certain things and people have inspired me. And so I'll, I'll share some of the personal stories that I have had the honor to uh, be a part of. So first I wanted to get to know y'all a little bit better. Um, some, of the, some of the great organizers who have been communicating with me and um, telling me a little bit about Sarasota um, said that we have a mixture of people here. So I thought I'd get a raise, uh, ask you to raise your hands if you are with a local business. Cool, welcome. Um, are you a, a public official? <laughs> Not sure. Um, are you with a local nonprofit organization? Awesome. Are you a community member, part of the general public? <laughs> Great. Welcome. It's so nice to see different people. Did I did I miss anybody? Does okay. Got everyone. Um, yeah, I'm gonna dive right in. So back in 2001, I was 19 years old and um, you know, pretty rebellious for an Indian woman. I grew up in India and um, I'll say really honestly because I think this, this was a pivotal moment in my life. We were watching, um, we were at a friend's place and we were all being teenagers um, and at one point, my, my friend's dad invited us to into the living room, and he said, hey, check it out, this is, this is serious stuff. And we were looking at the news, and we were looking at 9-11 happening. Um, and back then, even though I was really rebellious, um, I was a compassionate person. My parents, I'm very grateful to them, they've grown me up well. Um, but at that moment, when I was watching the Twin Towers come down, um, I could not help but feel a little bit like, ah, serves you right. And so, 
part of why I share that is because it absolutely shocked me that I would derive any kind of joy or um, anything positive from such a tragedy. Not only did I not know those people, but for some reason, America, in my mind, growing up in India, facing so many challenges and changes, somehow had become so other to me that um, I could not find common ground and find compassion. And so I, I didn't tell anyone about it because I was ashamed of having that feeling. Um, and then Many years later, you know, as, as I've been exploring social justice and working with a number of different organizations in India, um, that story comes to me because, because it was, I think that it really informed why I chose to come to the United States to bring my activism here, to cross that boundary, to share my cultural perspectives from India, and to lean into the darkness that I witnessed within myself. So if I'm compassionate, educated, and all these other things that we associate with change agentry, um, then if I'm able to still feel so other from, from someone ac across the globe, then I'm sure there are numerous other challenges and numerous other the people out there who are not able to identify with the other, the people that they identify as the oppressor for whatever reason. So it has been a really important journey for me to kind of dismantle those and really look at myself and learn um, from those mistakes and, and just, just from the learning edge. So 2010, finally after five years of my, my father telling me, you are a little radical for India and you should go and explore other parts of the world. <laughs> um, I, I was finally like, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go to America. I believe that there are advocates down there doing good work. I want to understand some of the changes affecting my city. And to give you a little snippet, um, from from the time when I was 10 years old to the year before I left for India, so between 1990 and 2009, 85% of the tree cover in my city was torn down for development and the IT boom. Um, and it has really informed who I am and why I choose to do what I do. Um, and I will say that it hasn't only been negative change, there has been positive change, but growing up, that felt like a war zone, and so that was part of why I identified America is this monster and it took me many years to to differentiate between government and its people um, and also just to just to understand that there are so so many more complexities um, than what is made available to us through mainstream media and other kinds of propaganda machines nowadays so in 2010 I was in grad school in Portland State University and um, part of my passion has also been waste management coming from the global south in India we see trash everywhere and so the idea of reusing trash and um, finding a place for it as we are increasingly challenged with it was really appealing and so we made a earthen bench with what we call port uh, portable land portable landfill devices or uh, eco bricks so we stuff the trash in the bottles and we embed them into the bench and I thought that um, Mary Douglas, who's an anthropologist, came up with this quote of, waste is just matter out of place. And I think it's a really powerful metaphor, not just for physical waste, but also looking at social issues and who's on the periphery and who's considered waste, whether it's houseless folks, um, other marginalized groups, you know, like how has the system created or displaced them from, from power or from, from finding, um, finding value in wh who they are. And so I transfer this metaphor to my social justice activism as well. So in grad school, um, like, like Nikki introduced me as a social cultural anthropologist and I worked with native people, urban native people in Portland, I still work with them. Um, they, there's a Native American Community Advisory Council, or NACAC, um, mainly to Portland Parks and Recreation, but we also work with other um, regional government and um, just a number of nonprofit agencies. And the picture on your left, the woman in the blue is one of my dearest mentors, Judy Bluehorse. I owe her so much. Um, and part of what she 
is doing <laughs> um, amidst many other amazing activists, Native American community leaders in Portland is that um, they are together reintegrating indigenous perspectives as well as land management practices into the urban um, ecosphere. And that has involved a lot of um, relationship building over decades um, and has finally, you know, fruited, I would say, in the formation of NACAC. And um, the picture on the left is when um, Judy did a blessing ceremony at, on our campus. It was just before we built the bench. Um, and I remember her telling me then, she said, you know, Riddhi, this is kind of, this is kind of important and groundbreaking. Native people have never been invited to bless PSU's land. So this is, this is a big deal to me. And I was like, Judy, I've known you for a year. If you said you wanted to do a blessing ceremony, we, we would have organized it like months ago. <laughs> and, um, but she, she has a gentle way of um, bringing people along and building bridges and creating allyship. And she, I call her a sorceress sometimes. Um, and the picture on the right is her with a Metro natural scientist. Metro is tri-county regional government elect in Portland. Um, they manage a lot of land over there, do a lot of restoration projects. Um, we are out at a restored Wapato field, um, about 12 acres. Um, Wapato was one of the first foods in this area. Um, and some people call it Wapato Valley instead of, sorry, Willamette Valley. And um, we've harvested uh, Wapato after doing ceremony. So basically, Tri-County Regional Government, Metro, invites a group of Native people, urban Native people, to go and do ceremony in land that they've been restoring for 12 years. And I was like, wait a second. We've talked about this, but this is actually happening um, one or two years after I started working with these people. And so that, to me, was, you know, pretty much weaving into being um, a dream and a vision for Native people to come back to this land and to hold a place of leadership in how we look at um, nature and culture. And, um, and I titled it Cultivating the Wild because part of, part of what the, the paradigm shift is looking as looking at human beings as an integral part of nature, um, reinserting them into it, and deconstructing some of this, the, the mythology that is mainly from um, Eurocentric perspectives on nature, about how the wild exists out there. Um, and it's, it's you know, revered in some cases, it's to be feared in some cases, but somehow that nature is outside of the human being. And I would say in a native cosmology, um, and also where I'm from, like a lot of our cosmology is about that partnership and that, that relationship that we have and that we are part of nature. And so while we are destructive, we also have the simultaneous ability to be really, um, in, to work in concert and in harmony with nature. And that, that brings me to Judy's mentorship model, which was pretty much, she's, she's an herbalist and a gardener, and that's, that's why I'm inspired to do that, bring that into my own work. Um, and the way that she worked with me was kind of, it, it was analogous to her, uh, the way that she worked with land, which is, you know, if there's a strip of grass and we're trying to make it a native garden, we wouldn't do so much to weed it out or you know things like that. We were very gentle and basically we were providing tilth for the for the plants that we did want to see, the habitat that we did want to see to return. And so when I apply that to how she worked with me, um, she you know I made mistakes. I didn't know Indian protocol. I would crack jokes about how I'm, I'm the other kind of Indian and things like that. And usually they go over well, uh, but there's a lot of protocol in Indian country and I was not familiar, I'm not from this land. And uh, people, for the most part, were, were, I mean, actually, nobody has ever been, has ever been very rude or um, uh, very heavy handed with me. People treated me with a lot of courtesy and um, genuine curiosity and concern um, and sharing very very honestly what was happening. Um, and so with Judy, as I was going through grad school and really struggling to figure out how I could um, straddle the academy and being a critical anthropologist, where they, we, we like our critical inquiry um, versus being 
um, being a collaborator with my native organizers and how do I how do I crystallize that into academic work that feels good to them coming from a discipline where most native people they were shocked that I was an anthropologist and I said someone's got to work from the inside and make things right um, because we have a long history of anthropologists studying other cultures and native people and writing about um, their practices from an outsider perspective. So there's a lot of sensitivity there. But anyway, all of that to say that Judy really believed in me. She saw in me someone I didn't see. And during those hard times when I was like, you know what, I'm gonna quit. This is too hard. I can't do this. I'm too too much fire. I just wanna say it like it is, like I see it. Um, Judy was always there saying, this is important work. We really need you to build these bridges. Um, they're, they're not they haven't been built um, for a variety of reasons, but we find ourselves in this time when it is super important that we come together. Um, and so she was laying, she was placing all of this tilt around me and calling me into my being, um, this thriving person in her community, helping her in a garden of collaborators. And I found that really poetic and profound. And I tried to, um, I try to use that when I'm working with volunteers or community members coming forward and saying, hey, I want to do this thing. But, but this thing happened, and I'm like, nope. We hold that vision that it is possible, and you can walk into it. Just, just keep walking ahead. And I would say it's not just me. Part of why I gravitated towards City Repair is because of this really proactive and um, loving, caring, community-oriented group of people. Um, those pictures show you smiling faces and um, also teary-eyed teary uh, people because there are a number of people who come to us, um, including myself, broken or just absolutely horrified at some of the things happening in our world. And we're trying to do the best that we can. We're like, how can I affect positive change given everything that we face today? Um, and I believe city repair and placemaking and what y'all are doing here is part, part of that solution and is part of what helps people go from you know all kinds of self-destructive de behaviors when we're not holding each other like the village that we used to be. Um, all of those will melt away for the most part, unless it's super serious, um, I believe, will melt away when people really find their place. Like, what is my place personally? within this world? And then how do I create places on the outside, sure, to reflect that back so that it creates this positive feedback loop and really helps us come into a being that is that, um, that replicates care? So I also want to share some, some stories from, um, from our community projects. Um, this one was the Native American Youth and Family Association Cobb Oven and Bench. And I share this because, you know, for me as a diversity, equity, inclusion specialist and a activist, um, and being most of the time the only person of color in the room, um, working with people from different perspectives and cultures is really important to me. And often people will take a look at City Repair's work and say, oh yeah, you you guys are always in inner Southeast Portland where all the middle income white folks live. You hippies, yeah, I don't really relate. And, and sure, that critique we take seriously. Um, and at the same time, I can tell you that we have had numerous projects implemented across the city in different demographics for different youth Uses. Some of it, yes, is lighthearted and, oh, we just want to have fun. But some of it, like, like this bench, um, is, has a deeper spiritual connection or whatever is relevant to the people that it's meant to serve and that it's birthed by. We don't tell people what, what they should do. Rather, we are facilitators for what is wanting to come. And so um, they made a salmon, I think it was a salmon, cob oven and an eagle bench and it was designed with elders and it was on their parking lot right by a medicine wheel garden that Judy Bluehaus, the, the person I call the sorceress, um, that Judy had helped design with students. And so making it culturally, culturally relevant um, is really important. 
Here's Dignity Village. Our co-founder, Mark Lakeman, um, were, is an architect, and so that's where some of our urban design and stuff like that comes from. But he was instrumental in helping create the first intentional village created by and for houseless folks. And um, they have one street painting, and they have a number of tiny houses made with straw clay, which is an uh, which is a natural building technique, and um, they they just have open door. We have an open door policy with them. They can walk into our program anytime and ask for support. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about where we stand with houseless advocacy towards the end. Here's a more fun-loving, child-centric garden. Um, I've heard that there are some challenges, which are opportunities uh, here in Sarasota to work in the public right of way. Uh, but I want to use this as an example of how you can you can embellish your front yard to have all of these these cool features and installations to invite people to linger that it is a destination that it is a place and that it reflects the people living um, nearby so here's one example it's a nature-based and child-centric garden um, with some with some branch work too for playfulness Here's um, an intersection, which is a painting in the middle, middle of the street. It was inspired by um, a neighbor in this area that passed on. And um, yeah, the people got together and they're like, we want to memorialize her. And some of the best public spaces, I believe, do this. You know, they, they call on your memory um, and they have that embedded into them. Here's another intersection repair project. And the reason I bring this up is it's um, inspired by SpongeBob SquarePants because the lady who, <laughs> I see some people like SpongeBob, um, the lady who spearheaded this project, her daughter is wheelchair bound um, and has been for a long time. I believe she has something like cerebral palsy or something. And Jade, um, whom this intersection is named after, Jade loves SpongeBob. And so, and she was out there painting um, in 2015 when they first did it. So across 20 years, we've had 400 projects. And, um, and all of these projects have embedded within them a really personal story, some something that inspired people, whether it's a memorial to someone they loved who lived in the neighborhood, um, a child, um, or a group of children that they want to create a better place for. You know, these are hundreds and now thousands of stories that just keep being embedded into these places. I thought I'd finally get to the vision to foster thriving, inclusive, and sustainable communities through the creative re reclamation of public space. And part of why we work in public space is because there, there is a huge lack of it in this continent. And what we found is that with this lack of public space, um, there is fewer opportunities for people to meet each other just on the roadside and, um, and just get to know people who are outside of our usual bubbles. You know, we tend to go to places where, where more like-minded people would, would exist. But on, in a crossroads um, where Typically, if it was auto-centric like it usually tends to be, then our cars may collide. It's a point of contention, potentially. But by shifting the lens on how we view these intersections and instead thinking of them as ways that are as places where our pathways come together, um, and it, it, it fosters the ability to meet people that we typically would not meet, perhaps. And I also wanted to add, we do work in um, private spaces. Um, sometimes people put in uh, like earthen building structures. The picture on your right was a large earthen building project from last year. Um, for, just for an example, people put in gardens, they put in benches, all kinds of things, embellishments um, on private property. So the public benefit that we see in working with private property is, again, to blur that line between public and private. We're so, we've been allotted these little boxes <clears throat> defined by 
<coughs> sorry, defined by property lines that were handed down to us um, in a new, again, Eurocentric conceptualization of land and how we own land and have power over land for certain kinds of functions. And sure, it helps to administer the land and to get taxes and to travel around. And it, you know, I'm not saying that those are bad things, but at the same time, They've also kind of limited our creativity and our understanding that we belong to the land and a lot is possible outside of those lines that we have abstractly laid upon them. And so with City Repair and the Village Building Convergence, our main goal is to, is to help people remember the villager that exists within them. And what would a villager do? Like, would you, you would think like a watershed and think to take water across property lines, which is not legal, um, or you would, you know, go and help your neighbor who is elder, elderly and unable to paint their house on their own. So we would go beyond our regular lives, nine to five lives, of going, shuttling back between work and, and our you know, other responsibilities to really look at who's around us and what kind, what kind of ways we can be um, supportive to them. And here's the basic model. Autocentric on the left, potential for collision in the middle, um, and then I also want to point out that unhappy looking dog. And then, <laughs> and then we do an intersection repair and we basically embellish the, animate the edges and then also put something symbolic in the middle, like serving a piazza or plaza model. Um, and then voila, doggies happy, people smiling, meeting each other. And um, I've seen this happen. It actually does happen. I didn't believe it. I'm a skeptic usually, but it does happen in quite that way. Um, also because it's not just like you, you take some cans of paint and go throw it down on the street. There's a pretty involved community engagement um, that surrounds all of these projects. And the things that emerge from it are, are quite mind blowing. Um, so the, another part of the intersection repair, apart from the paintings, are these little, like, well, it's not so little. These benches. <laughs> um, the picture on your right was the first city-funded cob structure um, on private land, and it's like used like a guest house. So lots of creative um, inventions and innovations. There's also a lot of ecological landscaping. Um, picture on your left is. Uh, is ODOT, so it's Oregon State Department of Transportation owned land that a group of students came together and said, hey, this is right by the Native American Center. We're going to make it a native garden. And so we were able to do it through the adopt a landscape, adopt a, adopt a highway or adopt a landscape pro program. The picture on your right is the homestead I used to live at. It's our front yard, and now it's a permaculture medicinal garden. And this is at VBC, the Village Building Convergence, um, 2012, I believe. Um, and Village Building Convergence is our springtime barn raiser. Um, it's when a lot of the projects tend to be implemented. I'll talk a little more later. But yep, that's, um, that's a garden being put in. And then, of course, our infamous intersection paintings that everybody tends to love, and some people tend to hate uh, because of the colors. But um, the one on your left is in Davis, California. I'm not quite sure where the, the one on the right is. Along with um, the earthen buildings and the paintings are these little installations like car benches, solar tea houses, little free libraries, which I know you have a local program here. Tons of stuff, bike shelters, tre trellises, um, community composting units, like the list just goes on. And all of these innovations have come from the community. We have not said, hey, I think it's a good idea to do X, Y, Z. Um, but a community member has said, don't you think it would be cool if all of us neighbors could get together and co compost our stuff together and I can take care of it and we can locate it right here? And we're like, that sounds awesome, let's do that. And, we, and we've just been, we've had a relationship with our local Bureau of Transportation um, for the last decade or so and they, they work with us, you know, and it didn't start out so good. I will say we broke the law when we began. Um, so, 
you know, building, yep, yeah, you do what you gotta do sometimes. <laughs> building allyship though, it wasn't an antagonistic relationship. We, d we did break the law, but we did so smilingly. Um, and so that often helps, you can ask for forgiveness later. Um, we've innovated, we've done mid-block repair, which is um, just an amendment to our existing um, ordinance. We've also done the block repair. We've planted, for example, pollinators along a block, um, and it's to you know, take down fences. The concept is to take down fences and to open up where our ba backyards would be and to have that function as a commons. And I live in a community that's headed in this direction. Looking at alleyways, other wasted spaces, sometimes crime arteries, people call them. Um, looking at them for art and inspiration and community building. Looking at parks, you know, there are gardens and other amazing potential um, that reside within our parks. And all of these repairs, like from the self to intersection, mid block, all of this stuff, um, ultimately to city repair. And that's why we call ourselves that. And some of the visions that we hold are based on those hyper-local actions of, of people being empowered to, um, to look after and to transform the places in which they live. That, I believe, is the fundamental step and fundamental block of, um, of thriving sustainable communities, is that we get to decide and that it's not impacted, it's not given to us from somewhere else where people don't know um, the context in which we live. Another way to look at placemaking, um, apart from the physical installations, is to do events. Um, on the right is the T-Horse, it's a legendary um, pickup truck with sails and bamboo, bamboo frames that go out and wings, and we distribute tea and we um, pull out rugs and pillows and facilitate people to basically sit and chat with each other. We, we do this in parks, we do this, we close streets down, um, and, it, and every time we pull it, take it out, there'll be at least five people walking by or biking by who will say, is that the tea horse? And we're like, yes it is. She still lives, going strong after more than a decade. Um, here's an example of Placemaking as peacemaking, and I again, I'm, I'm giving you these examples because I really believe they are super important to see the different ways that communities have taken the same tool and utilized it for different goals. Um, so this is a youth gang violence prevention program. They made five something ridiculous, like 500 little free libraries, and they worked with um, with young people who find themselves on the wrong side of the just, injustice system or justice system. And um, yeah, they're around town. And um, I'm sure those kids' kids' lives have been transformed in one way or another. Here's um, another project looking at um, health strips, government strips, parking strips um, as, as ways to um, provide pollinator support. You know, we all know that our pollinators are in decline. Um, and for me, it's not so enjoyable wa walking past a strip of grass. And so we're trying to infuse that with beauty and making it, again, like a destination. This is part of the most, possibly the most exciting work that we're a part of, um, for me personally. We're doing houses advocacy with a multi-sector um, coalition called the Village Coalition. Um, and to give you a brief update, we are in the process of making 16 sleeping pods. These are pre-approved um, pre designs, or I would say rather frameworks for, um, for housing for houses folks that are being designed by 16 different design teams. Um, they're going on display later on. Uh, we'll be meeting with City Hall. And again, this is all community driven. It wasn't the city government or any other government agency saying, hey, we have a problem with houselessness, let's do something about it. It was a bunch of people who just would refuse to sit and take it anymore. We were just compelled to act. And um, 
months later, I would say some of our general meetings include up to 40 people. And we've got the, the existing mayor's office represented, the new mayor's office represented, a number of different nonprofit agencies, and at least five houseless villages themselves. Um, pretty fantastic work. We'll be in, at City Hall next Monday, um, and we'll be unveiling them. And all of this stuff from Portland, you know, I didn't come here to pat myself on the back and say, yay, I'm part of amazing work in Portland. There's so much good stuff happening here. And while your context may be different, um, I've heard that the, the Sarasota tends to have a lot of elderly people. Um, but again, the, the, the process and the projects themselves remain, the, the technique remains the same. How you choose to apply it to your context um, could be different, and hopefully will be different, because then we'll get to learn from it. Um, and there's numerous ways that that is possible. I'm sure elders would like to have benches to sit on rather than walk forever. Um, I'm sure that there are multiple ways to enhance public spaces and private spaces to make them more tourist friendly. We've seen numerous commercial corridors you utilize placemaking um, as a strategy. You have a little free library program that's already working in parks. You can build around those, um, do solar powered cob kiosks. I don't know, who knows what kind of projects will emerge from here. And, um, and most importantly, part of the reason why I'm here is to represent that we at City Repair will walk with you. We've set precedents for a reason. We want this to be not just a national movement, but we want it to be an international movement. And given these times that we are in, and boy, are they strange, but um, given these times, um, I think it's even more important and imperative that we unleash our creativity out in the streets. There are so many people who are you know, afraid, shocked, um, looking to substances for, for reprieve. You know, there's so much sadness, and at the same time, there's so much goodness that we have within us. And so the more that we're able to create the places that reflect our inner landscapes and to, and to really elicit the, the powerful people that we can be, the more that we create those, the more that we will see people thrive. Thank you. That's okay. Does anyone have any questions that they would like? Anybody? No? Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you Nikki. so much.